okay, we should be good to, to begin now. Hey, first and foremost, I want to thank everybody for attending this uh, seminar, and I hope that everybody is well and their families are well um, as well. Uh, my name is Tom Mitchell. I'm with Ernest Mayer Construction Supply. Uh, Ernest Mayer is a full-service construction supplier in the Mid-Atlantic that focuses on masonry, concrete, and steel construction. We've, it's, we've supplied the Washington area since 1928, uh, and now we've expanded into Baltimore pretty much throughout. Our Ernest Mayer is, and its entities are committed to sustainable design. We've promoted carbon cure and carbon sequestration since 2015 and are now uh, more than ever seeking to enlighten our architectural firms, realizing that they can have a huge impact on uh, globe and carb global carbon mitigation. Uh, this is a great presentation given by a great presenter, Eric Dunford, and uh, I'm sure you will enjoy it and, and walk away enlightened and hopefully ready to uh, promote and use carbon cure. Th carbon cure. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thanks, Tom. So and as Tom just introduced, uh, the topic of conversation today is going to be low carbon solutions for concrete. Um, so this is going to be uh, an intro general introduction into kind of the principles of that and some options that are available to you. Um, we have a pretty small group today, so I'm just going to encourage you if you have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and interrupt me if you wish. I won't be offended by that. Um, and we can just address those in real time. So if you have questions, just feel free to pipe in. Uh, but this is AIA accredited. And so if you can provide me uh, or uh, the AIA, your local chapter with your AIA numbers, I'll make sure that you get this recorded as part of your educational credits. So um, first and foremost, what is kind of the issue here we're talking about? What is its importance? Um, so, some of you may have heard a little bit about this conversation to date, and a lot of it's really being driven by some research that's been undertaken by the AIA nationally. And this research is showing you know, that we can expect that there's going to be a continued growth in the built environment uh, in the foreseeable future. And they're projecting somewhere in the order of uh, an area or land mass the size of New York City being added every month for the next 40 years. An interesting thing that they noticed as they were doing this research is that um, historically, as you can probably assume, uh, most of the energy and emissions associated with buildings have been coming from their operational phases. So the purchase of natural gas, of electricity, um, all those types of you know, energy consuming uh, features that buildings have, that's traditionally been the primary source of an environmental impact for buildings. What this research shown by the AIA has, has discovered is that looking into the future, what we can expect is that um, the importance of what we would call embodied carbon or carbon involved with the construction materials of buildings is going to rise in relative importance. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, first and foremost is that uh, as we get more uh, effective at designing, you know, more efficient buildings, uh, higher performing buildings, as building codes evolve, uh, as we start to get access to more sources of renewable energy from, you know, on-site solar or perhaps wind or other forms of power like that, uh, we start to see the operational emissions decline. Uh, in addition to that, there's also another factor here, which is what they would call um, the time value of carbon. So if you're not familiar with that, basically the idea is, is that everything we do today will have a much greater impact on future um, emissions conditions and climate conditions than you know, potential uh, impacts that we have 20 or 30 years from now based off of operational emissions. So the real key factor of this study is saying that, hey, you know, architectural world, we should be considering very carefully what decisions we make around materials and what we choose to do in the next couple of years is going to be very impactful for the future evolution of the building environment and then also kind of global climate situation. So that led to the development of what they are now calling the Global 2050 Challenge. So this is a commitment by the AIA nationally to design buildings that are going to be focused on zero embodied carbon. So if you're not familiar with the term embodied carbon, the easiest way to explain it is that it's really all the energy and carbon that went into manufacturing materials. So an easy analogy here would be if you went onto the, the lot, or I guess these days you wouldn't be going onto the lot, if you ordered a car, let's say, uh, there would be a lot of energy that went into building that car before you ever got into the front passenger seat or the driver's seat and uh, turned the key. So everything to make the rubber, glass, steel, plastic, anything that's inside of that vehicle was already you know, representing a significant amount of energy, both from materials extraction and refining, uh, manufacturing, and then also the transfer of uh, that product to the end user, which would be you. 
So the same thing is happening here with buildings. So whenever you design buildings, all the materials that ultimately make their way to the job site, all of those materials already have a carbon footprint or a carbon, um, basically accounting already uh, connected to that product. So steel, glass, wood, concrete, all of it is containing carbon uh, that effectively speaking. So the real challenge here is how can we do better from a design perspective, a material selection perspective to get to this desired future? And an interesting thing has come out that the structural engineering community has also put out an equivalent standard, which, which they're calling Structural Engineers 2050, that is just, again, a commitment for reducing the embodied carbon of materials that go into building uh, retrofits and construction. Operational carbon, as I said, is all that traditional stuff you might be thinking about. It would be things like your utility bills, um, anything to do with actually using a space after it's been constructed. You may not know this, uh, but concrete as a material, as a building material, is actually the most abundant man-made material in the world. So after water, concrete is the most widely consumed substance across the globe. Uh, and as a result of that, cement production creates approximately seven or eight percent of the world's annual uh, carbon emissions, and it is the largest contributor to embodied carbon within the built environment overall. So concrete is a really important material to focus on. Uh, after the oil and gas sector, it's probably going to be one of the largest uh, sources of emissions. And if you think about it in terms of a nation scale, uh, concrete and cement is, would actually be the third worst uh, carbon polluter in the world after China and the United States if it was considered its own country. So that just gives you a sense of the scope and scale here. We're talking about a lot of emissions. Uh, cement and concrete are very universal products and they're made all over the world and they do have quite a large impact. When we talk about concrete, uh, what are we actually talking about? Where are these emissions coming from? And basically to get to the concrete products that you're used to seeing, what happens is right now we would normally go into the, the natural world we would uh, create these limestone mines and start digging up limestone deposits. Uh, limestone is also known as calcium carbonate from a chemical uh, structure perspective. And we take that limestone and we heat it up inside of a cement kiln and that generates uh, cement products. That stage is really where you're seeing most of the CO2 associated with concrete uh, development is occurring. So there's a reason for that, which I'll show in a few slides. Once you have your cement, you know, it goes to concrete manufacturers like Tom and the team at Ernest Mayer, and then you get your masonry blocks, you get your precast, you get your ready-mix products that come to the job site. And by the time you see them at the job site, uh, they're already, you know, their impact on the environment is pretty much already baked in. There's not much else that happens uh, over that impact. So, and again, just as a reminder, you think about concrete and just, I was saying again, that it's the most ubiquitous material in the world. If you really kind of just walk down the street, you'll see just the sheer quantities and abundance of concrete, especially if you're in, in a very urbanized environment. Uh, so it's, it's, ready, it's used everywhere. It's used for all sorts of purposes and for very good reasons. It's a very fantastic product. It just does, however, have a large environmental impact. The reasoning for that is this process right here. So as I was saying, you know, to make concrete, we need limestone. And when we have limestone, we need to uh, create cement. And limestone, which is calcium carbonate, it's turned into cement products by undergoing this process called calcination. And that is driven inside of a cement kiln. And what, we, what happens there is you would see very high temperatures and very high pressure. And that ultimately effectively splits that molecule in half. So that calcium carbonate becomes calcium oxide, which is a precursor to cement, and then pure CO2 gas, which is released uh, from stacks into the atmosphere. So that is one of the primary reasons why you see cement as a very high you know, contributor to annual global emissions. It's this process right here. And if uh, you're considering this, one thing that's really interesting about it is that it might be obvious to you that there isn't really an easy way around this because the source of these emissions is not from burning energy, it's not from uh, efficiency reasons, it's really that fundamental chemical reaction that is driving this emissions pattern. So that's what's interesting about concrete and the challenge associated with this material is that, you know, it's a fundamental chemical and physical process that leads to the impact on the environment, uh, primarily. So that said, once you have cement, uh, it gets mixed in, you know, with aggregates, with rock, with water, with chemicals, and you end up with your concrete products. And really, again, after the cement stage, you're looking at 90 to 95% of the carbon footprint of concrete already being you know, uh, baked in by the time the cement is made. 
So the later stage processes are really not going to be very impactful. This process is shown just here graphically. So again, we that raw limestone, other materials are put into the cement kiln. It's heated up to a very high temperature uh, using fuel. And then as a result of that, you will have CO2 exiting and what we would call clinker or the precursors to cement exiting that kiln. And that's where the cement will be coming from. And roughly speaking, when you talk about you know, a thousand pounds of cement being manufactured, that could mean as much as 650 pounds of CO2. So when you factor everything all in together, uh, I've, I've often heard of the equivalent stat of being every pound of cement is roughly equivalent to a pound of CO2 going into the atmosphere. So that's again, that, that fundamental chemical process does lead to a large CO2 emission source. Some of that's coming from combustion, the actual burning of uh, fossil fuels and other sources to create uh, the cement itself. So that's the energy being provided to raise the temperature and the heat. So that could potentially be affected by things like, you know, greater efficiency or by switching fuel sources or things like that. But the larger section of the emissions is coming from that direct chemical and physical process of splitting of that calcium carbonate which results in CO2 uh, at large quantities. And this is difficult to manage because it comes from the chemical reaction itself. This is complicated by the fact that, uh, as I was saying in that earlier slide, if we're looking at what the AIA is projecting, we're talking about you know, a, a New York City sized landmass being developed every month for the next 40 years. Well, as we would expect to see, the demand for cement as the primary ingredient of concrete is growing as well. Uh, and most of that demand is actually coming from other nations. It's coming from outside of Europe and North America. Uh, I heard an interesting stat recently that was saying that China itself has poured more concrete in the last three or four years than America has poured in the entirety of its existence as a nation. So you can start to see, you know, if we look at the future, uh, we know that cement and concrete production does have a fairly large carbon footprint. We know that it will continue to grow. The demand is growing. And as a result of that, uh, we can expect to see a greater environmental impact. So that all being said, when you actually look at concrete and cement as a material for buildings in comparison to some other materials, uh, their impact is, is there, it's quite significant, but other materials also have quite large impacts. Uh, so it's not to say that, oh, you should just never use cement. Uh, really the purpose of this figure is just to show that there's a lot of research being done looking at embodied carbon issues for all sorts of materials like glass and steel and timber and things like that. And I think, you know, my takeaway from a lot of this research is that all materials are going to have some level of impact. Some are going to be marginally better. Some will be marginally worse. But the reality is, is that they all have a place in the building sector. Uh, and, you know, it's not about which one is ultimately going to be better all the time. They will all have different applications. So really, it's a question of how can we do better with all materials? Uh, and that's really the challenge that we have. So this presentation is focused on concrete, but I would imagine some of the other presentations you've seen have been focused on timber or other options like that. Uh, and I think the takeaway here is really just that all materials we need to do better with, and they all have different impacts, and we have to consider those as part of design. And really, this is the kicker, though, is that you talk about raw materials. Concrete is going to be far and above the most commonly used building material, uh, as much as you know, four to five uh, items used for building construction are going to be concrete based. And that's just sheerly, again, the versatility of it, um, the applications it's used for, and some of the, the needs that are there. Some of it will also be code driven, um, but right now across the world, concrete is by far the largest material used in the building sector. And you know, consequently, it's the largest contributor to what we would call the embodied carbon challenge. So since we know all of this, uh, what's happening in the world, what's, what's uh, actually going on to provide tools or options to start addressing this challenge. And you know, this will be no surprise to you. This is an architectural based discussion. There's lots of things that have been happening, especially on the operational side of buildings over the last several years or decades. And that's led to a lot of really significant uh, growth in terms of more sustainable building materials practices and operational practices. And I think you know, the one thing that's really obvious is that the building sector is one of the only global sectors that is actually starting to see a decoupling of growth from emissions. So new buildings that are being constructed are not actually you know, one to one related to larger increases in energy consumption anymore. Uh, you're starting to see you know, much greater efficiency per square foot. 
And a lot of that has to do with the good work that you and your peers have been doing in terms of you know, finding uh, ways to be creative around doing better envelopes, uh, energy efficiency, you know, new technologies available for lighting and HVAC systems and all sorts of things like that have really started to lead to a, a significant reduction in operational emissions for new buildings. Uh, however, on the embedded carbon side, on the embodied carbon side, we haven't yet traditionally seen a lot of effort undertaken on that front. And that's why you're starting to see uh, that increased emphasis on it in the discussion. So it's really summed up right here with this kind of graphic. And this is coming from a study from Lund University in Sweden. And what it's looking at is a traditional building design. So if you just looked at the average building, maybe it was built in the 1980s or 90s or even early 2000s, you know, traditionally what you would expect to see is that the energy and carbon associated with building materials for those buildings would be about, let's say 12% or so, or maybe 13% if you throw in the construction phase of uh, the total overall energy and emissions associated with building that building uh, over a 50 year lifespan. So you're still seeing, you know, like, and you would say, see here that most of the energy and the emissions that is being consumed here is coming from the operational phase. Very little is coming from construction, very little is coming from demolition. It's mostly just purely the occupation of that building. Uh, this research, however, is showing that if you look at high efficiency building designs, ones where you have you know, good air tightness, you have um, more efficient fixtures, you have more efficient appliances, you have all these you know, innovations that have come onto the market for lower operational impacts, you would see that the, uh, overall, one, the emissions for the building drops significantly and the energy consumption drops significantly, which is a good thing. And that's part of the trend we've been observing over the last couple of decades. Uh, but as a result of that, by the result of reducing operational impacts, what you start to see is that the impact from materials themselves start to rise in relative importance. So again, if we're, if we're making advances or progress on the operational side of the equation, you can expect that if nothing's really happening on the material side, that that side is going to grow in importance, relatively speaking. So what this is telling us is one, first and foremost, is that architects are doing a really good job of bringing down the operational energy use of buildings along with structural engineers and you know, mechanical engineers and everybody else involved in the process. Uh, but what it's also telling us is that the materials part of the equation is only going to rise in importance over time. So if you look at some jurisdictions in the world, if you look at Seattle or Vancouver and British Columbia, uh, most of their power grid is going to be coming from hydroelectric sources or renewables like biomass. In those areas, I have seen reports that, you know, the relative importance of materials is, is much, much higher because on an annual basis, their operational emissions are almost you know, zero because what they're consuming from an energy perspective is clean energy that doesn't really have any emissions footprint. So if you are living in an area where most of your power is coming from renewable energy sources, the materials impact might actually be you know, one of the largest impacts your design could ever possibly have. And that's just reflected here again. Um, as you decrease the operational emissions importance, you would expect to see that materials uh, impact. You know, it's the same quantity. If you're looking at the same building, you're going to see the same quantity of materials, but the relative importance rises as that operational impact decreases. So all this to say that there's broad recognition that tackling this materials embodied carbon uh, energy uh, issue is starting to rise in importance. That's being shown in a lot of these uh, industry benchmarks and tools and third party certification programs. So if you look at what all of these groups are talking about right now, they are all starting to make uh, exceptions or account accounting for uh, embodied carbon as the way that they measure products. So looking at LEED or Living Building Challenge or you know, any of these other kind of standards, uh, talk about net zero, you start to hear, again, these standards are looking to incorporate uh, certification requirements for embodied carbon issues. So as I said earlier, Architecture 2030 or Architecture 2050 is really looking at reducing this embodied carbon footprint. If you look at the Living Building Challenge, there's an actual uh, credit there called Imperative 12, which is requiring you to account for the total footprint of embodied carbon for all materials that you're using in construction, and then paying for a one-time carbon offset tied to the project boundary. So this is interesting because they're actually saying, you know, one, you need to actually calculate what the impact of your building is from the materials perspective. And then number two, you have to then go and pay for it. So that would be hopefully an incentive for designers to drive down uh, that quantity. Under LEED, if you're familiar with LEED, if that's something you do in your day-to-day -day life, 
The new version uh, of Lee, which is called version 4.1, has introduced a credit in the materials and resources category that talks about uh, building life cycle impact reduction. And this one is proposing strategies uh, that designers can use to try to, again, tackle the embodied carbon issue. So one option under this credit is for the team to conduct a life cycle uh, assessment of materials and then show at least a 10% reduction over the baseline. Uh, so that's one thing I'll talk about later. I talk a bit more about our technology in, in particular is what relationship it has with that, that uh, issue. But I'm, you're starting to see this happen a lot more commonly. A lot of buildings are now going through this assessment and that's mostly because we've started to see a lot more tools come online to make that easier. So if you hear of tools like Athena or Tally or um, Skanska has one called the EC3 tool, all of those tools are coming onto the market uh, to make it easier to start to understand impacts from materials. Another topic, if you haven't heard uh, this before, if this is new to you, uh, there is a, a new tool or a relatively new tool that is starting to come out, which is uh, the environmental product declarations. So again, this was a very green buildings focused uh, item that's been on the market now for a few years, but it's been growing in popularity. What it effectively is, it's, it's kind of like a nutritional label for a material product. So an easy example of this would be perhaps, you know, if you were to go to the grocery store and on your list, you just had milk and milk was the requirement. And you said, okay, well, I know I need milk for this recipe. I'm going to go and buy milk. And you go to the shelf and there's maybe three different brands and they all just say milk on it. Uh, so that's what you get, you know? You look at the price and you say, well, all milk, all milk is the same. I'm going to buy the one that's the lowest price. Makes sense for me. All good. Well, what now if you go to the grocery store and you look at the milk shelf and it says cream or half and half or homogenized milk or 2% or 1% or skim or organic or oat or soy or almond or all these different iterations. And now as a consumer, you know, you're getting more information about the product and that helps you make a decision. So maybe you're somebody who cares um about having you know uh, a more vegetarian diet so you're looking at a soy option or maybe you're someone who's baking a specific item and you need a particular type of product so that's what you're looking for well this epd thing is really the same idea but it's for commercial manufacturing products so just as that milk example you were a consumer who previously was given the answer that all products are the same other than price uh, what this is doing, it's giving you additional information. So if right now you're just going out to the market and saying, I need concrete and I want concrete and all concrete is the same to me, other than the fact that whatever's the lowest price is, that's what I want. Uh, what you may not be realizing is that there's a lot of different things that are happening in the production of that concrete and it's not quite the same as just being, you know, replaceable one version for another. So what the EPD does is it allows you to look at these products and say, well, maybe I want a concrete material that has the lowest impact from a, car a carbon perspective. And you can now actually use these EPDs and look at it from that, that lens and help make your decision based off of that issue. If you have other topics like, oh, I need to make sure it has this particular content or it has this particular application, EPDs would also help you, you know, start to look and make decisions around those topics as well. So if you haven't ever seen an EPD, I would encourage you to go look for some. Uh, they're very informative. Uh, and again, if you're looking on the local market for products that you want, asking for bidders to provide you with EPDs is one way to put more information in your hands to help you make selections based off of your own priorities. So in this case, uh, on the focus of this discussion, if you really wanted to make a decision on concrete or materials around a lower impact material, uh, using an EPD would be a great way to start with that. One thing I will mention right now as well is that uh, there are actually industry-wide EPDs available for concrete products. And what that will allow you to do is you might ask the question of, hey, you know, I want to have a lower carbon impact material uh, for concrete, but what do I know? Like, what is even the baseline for that? What is the average? Uh, and that's what this industry-wide EPD can do is that it will show you like on average in the Northeast of the United States, you would expect to see an impact of this amount. And that way, if you then look at what an individual bidder is offering you, you can tell whether that uh, amount is higher or lower or roughly on par with what the average is. And that gives you, again, more information uh, for decision making. So if you want to talk more about that, happy to do so. Uh, just let me know. So that was all talking about, you know, what's the general issue around carbon in the concrete world? What's the whole issue around uh, the design 
a community for embodied carbon with products. You know, so basically the summary of that is, hey, materials have a big impact. Uh, they're going to have more of an impact over time, particularly as we get better at managing operational emissions. Uh, somewhat of an intractable problem for concrete because of the fact that this chemical physical process is there that creates a lot of CO2. So knowing all of that, what can we actually do? Well, the International Energy Agency, uh, along with a few other partners, put together what they called the Cement Technology Roadmap. And this has been updated, I think, in 2016. But basically what this was looking at was what would be some solutions that we could do to help this industry become uh, more energy or carbon efficient and a lower impact on the environment. And what that study showed is that if you look at uh, total projected emissions, if we just kept going the way things have always been done, by 2050, you would see you know, roughly a doubling of CO2 emissions from the cement and concrete sector. Uh, if we want to stay in line with global CO2 of reduction targets, then we would want to see that number, the current number, the, the number in 2007 at least, cut in half. So that means that we have to somehow find a way to reduce approximately 75% of that total anticipated emission uh, by 2050. And if you note here at the bottom right, it's saying that target would limit global temperature increases to a max of plus three degrees. If you pay attention to the conversation on emissions, that three degree number is higher than you know, what the average conversation is about. It's typically focusing on a two degree or a one and a half degree scenario. So again, if you look at the cement sustainability initiative, this was looking at, well, what can we do to find efficiency in the cement sector directly to reduce emissions? And what it's showing is that there needs to be about a 23% decrease uh, by 2050 in order to stay on that trajectory to a lower carbon future. Here's where it gets interesting. Um, what the study showed is that uh, this, this figure here, and this is kind of complicated, so I'm gonna walk through it. If you look at 2007 on the left, that's obviously the recorded billion tons of CO2 that's happening as a result of industry activity. Uh, and then the future numbers are projections. So uh, these different kind of colored lines are showing potential emissions reductions if we implemented certain forms of technologies or options. So the top one, which is red, is saying, if we find more efficient ways to make cement and concrete, we would expect to see approximately about a 10% reduction over the future uh, baseline total. If we were to do something like use alternative fuels like solar or maybe uh, hydrogen or other sources like that versus coal, you'd expect to see maybe another 24% reduction. Uh, and then here in the purple, this is what they're calling clinker substitution, which would be using things like fly ash or slag. If that was maximally used across the, the industry, you would see maybe another 10% another reduction. But if you look at all of that, what that obviously tells you is that now we're making cement and concrete more efficiently, we're using renewable energy sources, and we're doing something to replace cement. Uh, those are all the known technology options. If we did all of those things, we would only still get less than half of the way to the target that we need to get to. So this is why tackling things in the concrete and cement sector is challenging. And if you look at the operational side of the equation, you know, all these strategies I just talked about, all of those things have been done on the operational side and they've been quite effective. If you switch fuel sources, if you're more efficient on energy on the operational side, you can really drive down emissions pretty quickly. Uh, but the industrial materials side, it's a lot harder because even if you do all of those things and you do them well, you, may, you still aren't going to get to the target that's been established. So that leaves us with this big blue triangle here at the end. And what that's showing is what they call CCS or what I will call CCUS. And that will be a new term, I'm guessing. Uh, but what that means is carbon capture and sequestration, and the U would be utilization. So this is basically saying that for the cement and concrete sector to get to its target by 2050, it will need to find a way to both capture carbon and use carbon in a beneficial way in concrete production. So that's pretty important. It's a rare challenge for industry. It's, you know, how are we going to do this is up for debate. But that's the big challenge for the industry is what do we do with our carbon emissions and can we find a way to actually beneficially use them? So carbon capture and storage is traditionally something done by the oil and gas industry. Uh, it's something where you would capture emissions from a point source. If you have a manufacturing facility, if you have a power plant, you would just basically capture those emissions leaving that facility. And then you would inject them deep underground into these uh, you know, old either 
there was often like salt mines or they were formerly oil and gas reservoirs. And you're basically just injecting the CO2 underground and then hoping uh, and modeling and hoping that it doesn't ever come out of the ground again. So that's what capture and storage would be. The largest plant is in West Texas, and there's about 43 of them around the world to date. Uh, but as you can probably imagine, this is not a very cost-effective process. It's not very cheap. Uh, and what we're basically doing is taking you know, an unwanted waste and we're just jamming it underground and hoping that it just goes away. This also has a lot of you know, political and environmental questions around it. Um, you know, if you pay attention to the, some of the fracking discussion, there's similar issues at play there. So it, it is an, an, a valid option and it's something that's being used, but probably won't be enough to solve the problem in and of itself. So that leads us to the question of utilization, which is, can we maybe think of a world where the carbon that we create is something that actually has value and could be beneficial? Uh, and is there a possibility of doing that with concrete? And this process, uh, there's a number of technologies coming online that are focused on that exact thing. And the one I'm gonna talk about here today is what we would call CO2 mineralization. So that is where you take CO2 and you introduce it to concrete manufacturing. And what happens when you do that is a couple of interesting things, is that the CO2 itself actually becomes embedded inside the concrete as a solid material. It's basically a stone material. And then it is stuck inside that rock or that concrete uh, aggregate mixture for the lifespan of that concrete. So concrete is pretty fascinating. It's pretty unique uh, in the sense that, as I was saying, it's a large contributor to annual emissions, but it's also unique in the fact that it could potentially be part of the solution to that emissions challenge because it has this interesting property where you can actually embed CO2 in it in a beneficial way. And that's what we're gonna spend the rest of the presentation talking about. So to do this, you first need to have purified CO2. And where does that come from? Well, right now it normally comes from industrial emitters. So you may not be aware of this, but if you are drinking a Coca-Cola product or you're drinking a, maybe a Budweiser, uh, all those carbonated bubbles that are in there, uh, some of those are coming from industrial CO2 that has been purified and used for food and beverage purposes. So there is a market out there right now that is capturing CO2 from industrial sources and it's being used for those purposes. It's also used in laboratory settings, it's used in a few other applications as well. But the, the unifying feature of this is that even if you take that CO2 and you use it for food and beverage, it doesn't actually disappear from the atmosphere because when you take that, the second you crack open your Coca-Cola and you see that those bubbles fizzing, that CO2 is just going right back into the atmosphere again. So it's not really a, a removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, it's basically a diversion. When we talk about CO2 mineralization in concrete, it's actually not that. It's, it's a direct capture of CO2 and then it's being permanently uh, converted into a different material that cannot re-enter the atmosphere very easily. So in this process, you would be capturing CO2 again from those uh, gas suppliers. Uh, typically it would come from an ethanol plant or a fertilizer plant or maybe an oil and gas refinery or something like that. Uh, that CO2 gets uh, transported and stored and then it is directly injected as concrete is being mixed uh, through an automated control process. And that leads to it being converted into a solid material. So the underlying chemistry of this is basically the inverse of that original um, graphic I was showing of how we have CO2 coming from cement production. So that's shown here. And again, when you heat up that limestone under pressure and temperature, you see the split of that molecule. CO2 goes out. Uh, calcium oxide, a precursor of cement, is left behind, and then you eventually get your concrete. What CO2 mineralization does is it takes a portion of that CO2 and it reintroduces it back into the concrete mix. And what it happens then is that it will re it'll search for that uh, calcium oxide molecule, basically the other component or the other half of that original molecule, and it will reform calcium carbonate inside of concrete. So effectively what you will see is that calcium carbonate or limestone-like material growing on the surface of cement in concrete, and that is taking that CO2 that would formerly go to the atmosphere and it's turning it into a solid mineral inside the structure of the concrete itself. You can see that here in these uh, microscope images. So these little kind of sugar cubes, that's basically the calcium carbonate growing on top of the cement, uh, and it happens very quickly and they basically reform in this way. So that's uh, the underlying chemistry principle of CO2 mineralization in concrete. 
because it's forming that calcium carbonate or that limestone like material, you don't generally see a lot of other impacts to the features of concrete that we care about. So of production to date, you haven't seen any real is issues associated with workability or freeze thaw or pH or density, basically all of the, the issues you might care about. Uh, you can color concrete the same way. Uh, you can do all the things that you normally did with it. It just, the only difference is that it has a little bit more calcium carbonate uh, limestone uh, inside of it. And as a result of that, you get this interesting thing where you get concrete that you've always, you know, always used, always seen, but the difference is that by taking this approach, you're able to reduce carbon emissions at the same time. So for masonry blocks, you could get about 20 or 30 pounds of CO2 removed and stored in the, the block itself uh, for every thousand blocks. And for a cubic yard of ready mix concrete, you would see about 25 pounds of CO2 reduced. Precast would also be roughly around the same as that uh, ready mix total. So that gives you an idea of some of the potential of that. And I'm gonna switch over now to a different presentation. So bear with me for one second. And I'll talk to you a little bit about our technology specifically um, and what that might mean for you. Okay. So let me just share this one and we'll get going on this one. And I'll probably talk for another five, 10 minutes and I'm happy to open it up to questions. So that brings me to what our technology is about. Um, so as Tom mentioned earlier, um, I work for a company called Carbon Cure, which is a technology company. And the purpose of our technology is to help tackle the embodied carbon challenge in concrete materials. And we do that by basically creating a product that allows for CO2 mineralization to occur. So what you're looking at here on the screen is basically what our system looks like. So a couple takeaways, uh, it probably doesn't look like rocket science. Uh, really, it's, it's not that complicated. What you're seeing here is this stainless steel cylinder, which is, has the CO2 gas under pressure. And then you're seeing uh, the box to the right, which has our logo on it, which is a control system that basically uh, controls the rate of release of the CO2 from that tank. There's another component, which you can't see here, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the other takeaway is that this technology is installed at concrete producer sites themselves. So it is not something you see on a job site. It is not something that leaves the producer facility. It is located on the facility itself. Uh, and that's, that's it. Uh, and then the other thing is in the background, you're going to see the concrete mixing truck, which uh, wouldn't normally have our brand on it, but that would be how it gets delivered to, to a site. So how it all works. We install these systems, which look like this. So again, the other component that wasn't visible on the last slide is this control system with the touch screen on it on the left. And what that does is it integrates with the concrete producers existing systems to be able to introduce CO2 to allow for that CO2 mineralization process to occur. Now, the interesting part of all of this, which I haven't touched on yet, is that CO2, when you add it to concrete, actually has one other interesting feature beyond just being able to be stored in concrete. And that is that the CO2 itself uh, adds strength to concrete. So CO2 can make concrete stronger. And what that does is a double benefit is that you can then adjust concrete mix designs and reduce the amount of cement you need to make the same volume of concrete, um, which as you'll recall from the earlier presentation slides, where it's talking about the impact of cement, less cement is a good thing from an environmental perspective. So this all works by, we install our systems with local concrete producers. Uh, it gets injected into the, the, CO, uh, the concrete as it's being mixed. And what you would see is it kind of looks like a, a snow material or a fire extinguisher. It is basically dry ice that gets added to the, the concrete mixing and that gets uh, put in directly at the plant itself or into the back of a concrete truck. And it happens in real time. So there's no additional step to the production. There's no timeline issues. It just happens as kind of part for the course for regular concrete manufacturing. Uh, and then you're going to see it uh, come to job sites and the concrete will, will be available that way. And again, I already showed this, so I'm gonna skip through here. But again, just another image of that, that calcium carbonate particle growing on the cement. So this is the important bit of CO2 mineralization, which I'm gonna spend a few minutes on here. Uh, and what you're gonna see on the screen is there's this kind of this orangey, peachy colored graph here. And what this first graph is showing is that if you just took CO2 as an as a ingredient to concrete and added it to concrete, any old mix you would have normally used what you would expect to see is that the strength of that concrete would increase. So typically around 28 days, if you add a certain percentage of CO2 to the mix, you would see the strength go up by about 10%. So what that tells us that 
The formation of those calcium carbonate particles, that nanomaterial inside of the concrete, will improve the strength of the concrete itself. So the interesting bit is this one, which you're going to see now a more complicated graph with three different shades of orange. So the first one on the left is this peachy colored one. And that would again be a standard concrete mix that you would specify on a, on a project. So let's say you, you had a project where there's a, a need for 4,000 PSI concrete. You would go to a producer and say, I need this kind of concrete. I need this strength of concrete. Can you give it to me? And they would say yes. And then you would get it. And it would be made the way it's always been made. Uh, and everybody's happy. In the middle, this uh, darker colored orange, this would be what would happen if you reduced the cement out of the mix. So if you took out some cement from a traditional mix, what you would expect to see is that the strength would go down. And that's because cementitious material is what really gives concrete its binding ability. And that's what, that's what makes it strong. Uh, so if you just take cement out of a mix, you would see strength go down. That's not a good thing. If you need 4,000 PSI concrete and you take cement out, you're, you're having problems then, right? Uh, so what we're doing through the CO2 mineralization process uh, is that what we can do is instead this darker colored graph the, uh, bar, the orange bar to the very far right, which is that when we reduce cement, we can actually regain the original strength by adding the CO2. So since we know that CO2 makes concrete stronger, if we add it, uh, it can actually make up for some of that strength loss from taking out cement. So what that means is that you can have concrete mixes that look and feel the same, but the only difference is that the strength profile is coming from a mixture of cement and CO2 working together rather than just cement or just cement and fly ash or something like that. So that allows us to reduce the cement content of concrete mixes without sacrificing on performance or on strength. Uh, and again, uh, neutral effects on pretty much every pro other property of concrete you can think of. So if you're worried about things like air content or temperature or finishing or all those sorts of things, we haven't seen much of an issue with that uh, at all. And you, could expect, you would expect to see that the same performance would be available for concrete you buy that has CO2 embedded in it in the form of calcium carbonate as you would any old other traditional concrete. In terms of long-term durability for buildings that are you know, going to be standing for a long period of time, uh, some durability testing has been done and we continue to do durability testing uh, across a lot of different uh, um, research projects. And what these studies are showing is effectively that, you know, if you make these new calcium carbonate particles inside of concrete, you can expect to see that the durability of concrete should either be neutral or positively affected. So again, as I mentioned before, we talked about CO2 reduction. If we talk about ready mix concrete, uh, you can basically use one pound of CO2 to inject into the mix for a cubic yard, and that will allow you to back out enough cement to account for about 20 or 40 pounds of CO2 reduction uh, that way. So depending on the mix design itself, you could be looking at a CO2 reduction in the range of, you know, uh, somewhere like 20 to 40 pounds of CO2 being cut per mix per cubic yard. So that is what it looks like on a, on a unit scale, on a per cubic yard scale. On an actual building scale, it starts to add up pretty quickly. So this is a building in Atlanta at 725 Ponce de Leon Avenue. It's a 360,000 square foot commercial building. Um, and this one, they used carbon cure or CO2 mineralization for every cubic yard of concrete inside the building from the foundations all the way up. And by doing that, they were able to reduce the carbon impact of the building by one and a half million pounds of CO2. So if you convert that to a tonnage perspective, that's about uh, 750 to 800 tons. And the average American, uh, typically in their day-to-day -day life over the course of a year, would generate about uh, 16 tons of CO2. So you can start to see the impact of that. Um, I've had conversations with some other designers that were saying that this was actually uh, a better bang for the buck than it was to do things like geothermal in terms of offsetting emissions. So uh, it could be a potential option uh, for commercial projects for sure. More locally to you, uh, at the MGM National Harbor, if we have any gamblers in the audience, uh, this is a million square foot casino just east of the city. And this one, uh, they used uh, carbon care masonry blocks and they were able to save 1.2 tons of CO2 just by using blocks. Uh, and then that one again, no, no ready mix was used. They just used the masonry blocks for that one. Uh, but that's a, that's a building you may have been in already that you may not have known had concrete uh, using CO2 already. And Another option here, uh, LinkedIn's new headquarters in San Francisco. Uh, there's actually a video that Bill Gates put together uh, on this particular building that I'd encourage you to take a few minutes to watch. 
It talks about uh, their strategy to reduce emissions from materials that they buy, and uh, carbon care was one of those options that they employed successfully. And then just looking at extreme situations, this is a, a de-icing facility for uh, air, airplanes in the tarmac in Calgary, Alberta. So the temperature there in January is usually around minus 20 or minus 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, planes are getting sprayed with these de-icing chemicals. Um, and obviously this is an airport with very highly regulated uh, concerns for standards for materials. And uh, they were able to use CO2 mineralized or carbon cure treated concrete for this application no issue, and by doing that, they were able to save 160 tons of CO2, which for airlines is obviously a major concern for them. Then looking at other examples, just to kind of give you the breadth of it, um, everything here from hockey rinks to McDonald's to uh, the wharf redevelopment on Washington DC's harbor, uh, saltwater aquarium, uh, road application in Hawaii, so all sorts of different applications of concrete have been tried with this uh, to date. I mentioned that earlier, I'll skip it. But uh, yeah, just to reinforce that fact, uh, this is not uh, a future technology. It's not a future option. It's actually available to you right now, if you so choose, if it's something that interests you. And uh, more than 200 concrete plants across North America have utilized this technology to date. And there's been more than 5 million cubic yards of concrete produced and poured. So you, looking locally, this is just a map from our website that just shows where there's current plant installations in kind of the Potomac Valley up to uh, Baltimore region. So what you can see is that there's a number of concrete producer plants uh, located within the region that can offer this to you. Uh, so Ernest Mayer with Tom Mitchell on the phone would be the first person I uh, connect you with, but also uh, Cheney, Vulcan, Superior, Schuster, Rockville, a large number of producers in the kind of greater Washington DC area uh, have this product available. So if you call them and talk to them about it, they shouldn't be uh, uh, confused. So final thoughts are, if, you think, if you're interested in tackling the carbon footprint of the building materials that you source, including concrete, uh, what are some options available to you? The first one is just simply looking at materials themselves. So could you get away with a, a cement or concrete mixture that has less cement in it? That's a question more for structural engineers and for architects, but it could be a, quite a conversation worth having. Uh, looking at EPDs is a really good way to get more information for your decision making and then using things like fly ash and slag are a good idea uh, along with any salvaged or recycled materials if that's possible for you. Uh, look from a design strategy, uh, the first, the best thing to do like always is to repurpose existing buildings uh, as much as possible because that re replaces the need to, for new construction. And then looking at the full life cycle impact of your design. So again, using those LCA tools like uh, Athena and others are a good way to actually look at, hey, you know, what are my decisions actually causing in terms of an impact uh, for construction, for material selection, for operations, all those sorts of things. And then continuing to focus on operational efficiency. Looking at concrete in specific, uh, what can you do? The best strategies that are available right now to look for low carbon options are to look at performance-based specifications rather than prescriptive-based ones. Uh, looking at cement replacement, by using fly ash or other options like that, uh, looking at maximum cement limits, and then also looking at other potential uh, technologies such as ours. Working all those things together, it is possible to get as much as a 70% reduction of cement, uh, and therefore, you know, approximately a 70% reduction of the carbon footprint of concrete uh, by taking all of these approaches working together. So I'll leave that with you as food for thought, uh, but I'm going to stop sharing the presentation now. And if there's questions that are on the line, I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have. And I don't think I muted everybody, so you should be able to unmute yourselves if you have a question. All right, well, Tom, perhaps you could maybe mention a little bit in terms of some observations from your experience in the DC market um, relating to lower carbon concrete, uh, just for the audience here. Well, what I had said in the past, Eric, was that uh, um, having been 20 years in the industry, I find that any of these new products, uh, for example, like when we introduced Aeroscraft, which was calcium silicate as opposed to using concrete, it took a little bit of time for, um, architects, engineers to accept the fact that we were going to get a new product into the industry. I think the same thing holds true with carbon cure. 
Um, this is my fifth year of presenting it in the Washington market. And we had some uh, early pioneers, uh, such as the Smith Group with the MGM, totally successful project to the nth degree. We're finding now more than, uh, uh, than ever that we're starting to get architects that, uh, and, and archi large architecture firms that are starting to really take this seriously. And, and so I'm feeling that the uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt has sort of like uh, moved aside. People are accepting it. There's more projects that are going on. They realize the need for uh, helping out to mitigate, mitigate carbon going into the atmosphere. So it's a, it's a timing type of thing where I feel that much sooner than later, uh, Carbon Cure will be a staple in all concrete products as opposed to um, uh, sort of an ad mix, if you will. Great. Thanks, Tom. And Tom, perhaps you could have a conversation or broach the issue. One of the questions we often get as well is um, for the architects or for the, the owners, what any implications or costs associated with that in terms of, uh, you know, what, what net cost is there to the end user and that sort of thing? Well, brilliantly, as the industry has uh, discovered that by not having to add as much cement into the mix, um, it's uh, offsetting the cost of, of, uh, of using the technology of carbon cure. Um, early on, for example, if you go to Home Depot and you bought a concrete block that cost $1.25, uh, we were saying about four or five years ago that it would have about a 6% upcharge for that concrete, 6% uh, of $1.25. Let's say that would be like uh, $0.05 cents to, to $0.07 cents to the cost of the block. Now you'd be paying about $1.32 for the block. However, by virtue of the fact we're using less cement, offsetting the cost, um, it's uh, virtually a break even at this point in time. Great, yeah, so if this is again, something that you're interested in for your projects, that just be aware that most of the time for most applications, you shouldn't be seeing a tremendous cost premium for it. And that's been the case that we've observed in multiple, multiple states, multiple markets. Um, so hopefully, I, I, I know that's obviously a common concern with limited project budgets and everybody always looking for the most efficient uh, costing solutions. So um, one option, interesting option here, as Tom points out, is that because of that balancing of some of the material inputs, uh, this one strategy for reducing the carbon footprint is actually quite cost competitive in a lot of ways. Eric, I saw that uh, one of our participants today is uh, from the architect, architect of the Capitol. And, um, you know, Washington, D.C. being an extraordinarily sustainable uh, area, um, I'm, as I had said in my uh, earlier uh, uh, input, was that I feel very strongly that within due time, uh, maybe within like the year or so, it's, it's going to really catch hold. And uh, I, I think Carbon Cure is looking to. Um, have some editorials in some of the major newspapers, for example, the Washington Post as well, to, to introduce it and just give people a better understanding so that they uh, don't have that fear factor of using the new technology. So the more that architects uh, talk, talk about it, the more we discuss it, the more we see more products coming or more projects coming into the fold. Uh, I think that we're setting ourselves up for a very positive carbon cured future. Excellent. Well, if there's any questions, happy to answer them. And if not, I will uh, let you all go back to your day-to-day -day lives and break for lunch here if you're on the East Coast, I assume. Uh, but otherwise, I want to th again say thank you for spending the hour with us and that you will get a certificate from me as well. I will, I will register your uh, attendance with the AIA directly so you can look forward to that. And, and again, this has been recorded and will be available with the Potomac Valley AIA. So if there's any other peers of yours that are, would be interested in hearing this conversation, uh, by all means, do feel free to email me directly uh, or they will be, that will be available as a resource for them as well. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll end that here. Thank you, Eric.